Jill Baldoff, Associate Dean Alumni Relations, UCLA Anderson. Thank you so much for joining us today for the UCLA Anderson Alumni Association's Friday Faculty Chats. Today, we are very excited to have Professor Cassie Mogilner Holmes. She's an Associate Professor of Marketing and Behavioral Decision Making. She holds the Donna Lisa and Bill Barnum Endowed Term Chair in Management. Prior to joining UCLA Anderson, she was a tenured faculty member at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, where she was an award-winning teacher of strategic brand management. She earned her PhD in marketing from Stanford and her BA from Columbia as a psychology major. Cassie studies happiness and she teaches a very popular course on applying the science of happiness to life design. I think we can all agree we all need to apply happiness right now. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. You're all on mute, but we welcome your questions. Please utilize the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen to ask the questions. Just type in your questions and Cassie will address them at the Q&A portion of the presentation. Please don't use chat to direct questions at the professor. Cassie will speak for, for approximately 35 to 40 minutes and then we'll follow up with 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Professor Mogilner Holmes, it's all yours. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. And I am so happy to be here with you to talk about staying positive in these unhappy times because we want to be happy. The American Constitution declares it an inalienable right and people around the globe consistently rate it among their most important pursuits. And this isn't new. Back in the 17th century, the French philosopher Pascal observed all men and presumably we also meant women, seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. But wanting to feel happy might not seem right these days. We are living in stressful, scary, and sad times. We feel constant fear that we or our loved ones will get sick and we feel heartbreaking sadness hearing from those who have lost loved ones who got too sick. We are scared for the economic state of the world and for our local communities and for our own financial well-being as salaries and jobs are evaporating. We're sad for our friends and the millions and millions and millions whose jobs have already been lost. And we're stressed trying to figure out how to exist quarantine in our homes without knowing for how long and without being able to go out and do all the things that we view as fun. And we are sad crossing off so many of those fun things from our calendars that were sort of waiting for us. But with all of this badness, striving for happiness might seem indulgent, but it's not. Yes, you are necessarily going to feel some very negative emotions at points. But the extent to which you can shift towards a more general state of positivity is going to be what gets you through this. And this is important, not just for you, for yourself, but also for the people around you, your family members and friends, your teams and organizations, and for our community and society. Research has shown that being happy and feeling happy has positive consequences across our domains of life, in the workplace, with respect to our inner uh, personal relationships, and even with respect to health. Feeling happy keeps us motivated, feeling confident, confident, and able. Happiness also increases our creativity and adaptive problem solving, which we need these days as we're figuring through this new remote learning or working environment, as we figure out how to be productive, how to work effectively with our colleagues and how to teach and engage our MBA students through Zoom. It also benefits our interpersonal interactions. Experiments show that when we are made to feel happy, we like other people more and we are liked by other people more. Plus feeling happy makes us nicer. 
It makes us more likely to say and do kind things for others, and it makes us more likely to help out. There is also some evidence that happiness helps our health, boosting immune functioning and helping us respond better to physiological stressors. All of this points to happiness as crucial to making us resilient. It is not indulgent. It is needed, especially during these unhappy times. And I want to say it again, prioritizing your emotional well-being won't just help you. It will help you help your family, friends, organization, community to move forward and remain standing on the other side of this crisis. And as managers, you should care about the happiness of those on your team. Happy employees are more engaged, more productive, more willing to go above and beyond to help their colleagues and you, their manager, and the organization. And happy employees are less likely to burn out and leave. So what determines our happiness? Well, a big chunk of it is based on your natural disposition or set point. Were you born? Are you naturally a positive person tending to see the glass as half full? Now, the reason our natural disposition has such a big impact is because it influences how we proceed, respond to, and adapt to the stuff that life throws at us. Then there are the circumstances, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Those include things like income level, attractiveness, marital status, parental status, et cetera. And these are the things that actually people think would have the biggest influence on happiness. When I talk about happiness, people always are asking me about the role of money. But if you look at the effect of each of these things over time, they have less of an effect than you might think. And that's because we adapt to these circumstances and how we react to is what influences how we feel in our day-to-day -day life as well as how we feel about our life overall, our general life satisfaction. Our natural disposition influences how we adapt and react, and that's why it has such a big effect. But we can also do things to influence how we adapt and react. And it's this last piece that I'm most interested in, you should be too, because it's this piece we have control over. A significant chunk of our happiness is determined by what we think about and focus on, what we do and how we behave in our day to day. Now, notably, many of these ways of thinking and behaving that research has identified as positively contributing to happiness, these are things that mimic the tendencies of naturally happier people. But it's important to identify these things so that A, those who naturally have a more negative disposition can practice and train themselves towards having a more positive experience in life. And B, even those of us who are naturally happy are sometimes presented with pretty lousy circumstances. And it's useful to go to and pull from these empirically tested and proven tools to get us back on track. Indeed, for all of us, and even more so for some, this COVID crisis has put us in a pretty darn lousy set of circumstances. It's testing the positivity of even the most positive among us. And I am an example of that. I am known for my happiness. But a couple of Saturdays ago at the breakfast table with my husband Rob and two kids eating pancakes, I broke down into tears. <laughs> I was just overcome by all of this. And that's okay. And after giving myself a bit of space to feel and notice my sadness, I went to the tools that research has shown can increase our happiness and the same tools that I teach my students. And I'm gonna share some of these with you. All are based on research, but I'm gonna make this a little bit more personal sharing how they have helped me in my experience over the last six weeks. So you are here with me in my home in the corner of our guest room um, with my safer at home hippie hair. <laughs> I can't do anything about because we can't get haircuts these days. And I'm making it personal because it is personal. 
it's not about societal sentiment or about how you should be feeling. It is about you and your personal well being. It's about how you feel and the things that you can do to make yourself feel a little better. And not all of these things are gonna resonate equally well for everyone. So just listen and potentially try some of them out and use the ones that work for you personally. The first one is so, so simple, but it is so important is to breathe. So we are feeling high levels of anxiety and anxiety is this future focused negative emotion that gets exasperated by not knowing what's gonna happen and a lacking sense of control. And these days, not only do we not know what is gonna happen, when and how long we're gonna be in this, when and how we're gonna emerge from this, but we are also fearful of what the future has in store for us. Deep breathing is a simple yet effective way we can manage our anxiety. Taking long and deep breaths helps us recenter into ourselves and into the present moment. So when you feel yourself spiraling, just pause and take a few deep and long breaths. You can also set cues or reminders for yourself throughout the day to sort of remind yourself to close your eyes and take say five, five deep, long breaths. And those cues can be anything. It could be like saying right when you wake up every morning, when you're waiting for your, the water to boil for your tea or your coffee to brew, or when you're going outside to pick up the newspaper. <laughs> As I was saying that, I realized that my husband is probably the only person remaining in the world that still gets a physical paper delivered. But in any case, whatever cue you set for yourself to remind you, okay, I need to just pause and take those deep breaths, do it. And deep breathing is part of meditation practices. Uh, meditation is the practice of turning your attention away from those distracting thoughts. You now, as we're <laughs> trying to think about what's going to happen, um, what, you know, make those predictions, which of course we can't, but meditation leads us to focus our attention on a single reference point, on our breath, on the present moment. And this helps quiet our racing mind. And research has shown that meditation has a ton of cognitive and emotional benefits. It decreases mind wandering, training us to focus on the present moment and the task at hand, which we need. And by keeping us from ruminating on all that scary stuff that's outside of our control, it effectively reduces our anxiety, our depression, lifts our mood and overall sense of satisfaction in life. If you need guidance, in meditating, there are a bunch of options available for you. In addition to apps like Headspace and Calm, which my students have found useful, there are also the UCLA's Mindfulness Awareness Research Center offers free guided meditations in English and in Spanish. So go to their website and you can learn about the amazing research they do, but also they have um, guided meditations and even uh, sort of training for how to set yourself up um, for a meditation practice. A super simple meditation that I've actually been doing with my kids outside is this five senses meditation. So what you do in this is you go through each of your five senses, identifying first five things that you can see, four things that you can feel, three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And so you can do this alone, or as I said, I do it with my kids where each of us sort of go through um, for each of the senses. And doing this is calming, which is great. And it's also really lovely because it's been leading us to notice the loveliness of the quiet of our city. We've seen and heard the hummingbirds in our neighborhood. Um, and actually with now that the white noise of the 405 has um, disappeared, we can actually hear a ton of birds. Our back yard sounds like a rainforest and we live in the middle of a Um 
but it's helpful. It's sort of, it leads you to, you know, you feel the breeze, you smell the breeze, which is, you know, this here in Southern California, that mixture of desert and ocean, and it just feels like home. Um, and you see and smell the flowers in our neighborhood. We've been going on neighborhood walks and roses are in full bloom and it is beautiful. These are some roses that we saw in our walk yesterday. So try out this simple, simple meditation. Again, you can do it um, by yourself or with others and it draws you into the here and now. It reminds you to breathe and then it increases your sort of noticing and appreciation of what's around you. If meditation isn't your thing, then you are like me and you struggle sitting still for more than like two minutes. You can also consider trying yoga. Um, it involves movement along with breath. And there are a ton of online yoga sessions. Zoom has <laughs> been declared 2020's hottest yoga studio. And I've been doing yoga once a week in the morning and it's been helpful. But whether it's through meditation, yoga, or those little reminders you set for yourself, just remember to breathe. Another way to manage your anxiety is to make sure you spend some time offline. Limit your news intake. Know the trusted sources you can go to in order to stay informed, but limit your exposure to news and social media. The constant barrage of scary news and the recirculating fear that you pick up um, on social media can become debilitating and anxiety provoking. And so minimize and be aware of that and manage that for yourself. The third thing is get moving. Research shows that just 30 minutes each day of exercise uh, can boost your mood, decrease your stress levels. Exercise also makes you feel physically capable, which translates into an overall sense of self-efficacy. And this is particularly important right now when everything feels out of our control. So get moving at least once a day, and it doesn't have to be intense and it can take a bunch of different forms. I like pairing it with the opportunity to get outside. So going for a morning run, um, going for a walk, but you can also make it more social and do it from the comfort of your room um, through you know, these virtual uh, exercise classes, or you can invest in a trampoline like we did. Not only does it get the kids energy out throughout the day, we sort of <laughs> in between in their breaks of homeschooling, we're like, go jump, get your energy out. But also my husband and I have found that it's kind of impossible to not start smiling <laughs> when you're jumping. Or you can turn on the music, recruit family, roommates, or just do it solo and have a dance party. Or even better, <laughs> turn up the music even louder and given that we can now not outsource our cleaning these days have a cleaning party <laughs> this will increase make your home cleaner it will make you feel very effective and it can be a little bit of exercise however you want to do it you do need to get out of your desk chair and get moving at least once a day Now, again, there's so much out of our control. We need to be able to assert it where we can. And establishing structure in the day helps us retain a sense of control over our lives. So to do this, treat work days like work days and weekends like weekends. Since our work and our personal life is now conducted in the same space, it's really important to protect each from each other. We want to complete our days feeling a sense of accomplishment. And this requires protecting the time and space to get done what we need to do. So during the week, work week, have an established morning routine that includes getting out of bed, making the bed, showering, getting dressed. And given the benefits of exercise that I just shared with you guys, exercise might be part of that morning routine. Hopefully by now you've set up a place in your house where you can work without too much distraction. 
And sitting there signals to yourself as well as to those around you that you are at work. Now I, as you can see me here, I have taken over the corner of our guest room as my home office. And in that last day before the lockdown, I wheeled out from my office at Anderson, my office chair, <laughs> and I took the computer and my desk lamp. And I promise I will return them when I return to my office at school. Um, and then I have this table, which is a folding picnic table that was in our garage. Pulled that out, put a tablecloth on it, put my little plants, um, creating my space to work and get things done. And I realize I am very lucky um, to have a door that I can close. Not everyone has that. Um, I will also note that in addition to being near our cat's food, I am very dangerously close to the refrigerator. But my husband is right upstairs, um, sort of next to our daughter's dolls. And his COVID purchase, which you can see, is his standing desk. And having an established workspace and routine is similarly important for kids. Um, my son's school actually is requiring the kids to wear their school uniform shirt which is nice because it serves as a cue for them that it is time to focus. And please <laughs> ignore the ginormous hole in the knee of his pants. But I will say that one of the benefits of all of this is that he can wear those holy pants um, for school these days, which we wouldn't have been able to get away with otherwise. So there are actually a number of benefits to our current existing working from home that we can and should leverage. A big one is our lack of commute. So there is research, time tracking studies that assess um, what people are doing over the course of their days, as well as how they're feeling over the course of their days. And what this allows the researchers to do is to identify what are those activities that are associated with the most positive emotions and the happiest activities, and what are those activities that are associated with them most negative emotion. And what these studies consistently find is that commuting is the least happy activity in our day. And notably during this crisis, none of us have to commute. So we have eliminated the very worst activity in our day. And also we've regained those minutes that we would, would have spent commuting that we can allocate otherwise. Working from home also gives us some flexibility. So for instance, if you find that you're clearer in your thinking and more efficient in your work in the early morning when you aren't expected on Zoom meetings and your kids aren't up yet, you have the option to roll out of bed and get a couple hours of really good work in before those distractions of everyone else being awake and online. Um, my husband has actually used this tactic and he is, he's getting a lot out of it. Or like me on Thursdays, you might want to get the workday started and then go for a mid-morning run um, as a nice uh, break for fresh air. So we have the flexibility and in normal life, my kids are not at school in the next room, but now they are. So we can have lunch together picnicking in the backyard. <laughs> but whatever structure you use, the important thing is that you feel in control and are deciding how you spend your time. Don't let your schedule happen to you. Rather than being reactive, be proactive with your time usage. Just because meetings <laughs> don't require you traveling, Zoom meetings can absorb entire work days and apparently I have found entire work weeks. So protect your time, your work time, for doing what is necessary to reach your desired and required output. This will help ensure that you finish out the day feeling that needed sense of accomplishment. Just as critically, shut off at the end of the day to relax and do those activities that you love to do. Have a cocktail, go for a neighborhood stroll, set the table and have delicious dinner, watch a movie, play games. 
my casual polling of family and friends has shown that folks have been doing much more of these things, particularly the alcohol consumption, uh, during the last six weeks. And it's nice because before this forced pause, movie and game nights never found their way into our sort of hyper scheduled and rushed uh, work weeks. Also important is to shut off at the end of the week. Uh, with my colleagues here, Anderson, Colin West, and Sanford DeVoe, we show the importance of treating our time off for what it is. It is time off. In life before the coronavirus, our weekends had become so routine, filled with chores, social obligations, catching up on work. We didn't really notice our weekends as a true break which is notably what a vacation is, a true break. And we found analyzing Gallup data that making time for vacation is significantly positively related to happiness and feeling satisfaction in life. So what we did was we ran a couple of experiments um, testing what would happen if people treated their weekends like a vacation. And I'll tell you about how how we conducted this experiment. So basically each of these were conducted over the course of a regular weekend. And on the Friday leading into the weekend, we gave our participants, and this was conducted among um, American workers who typically get their weekends off. Um, and we gave them a set of instructions on Friday leading into the weekend. We told half of them, treat your weekend like a vacation. That is to the extent possible. Behave in ways, think in ways as though you were on vacation. And then we told the other half of participants in our control condition, treat this weekend like a regular weekend. That is to the extent possible. Think in ways and behave in ways as though you were, um, as though it was a normal weekend. And then they were left to interpret these simple instructions, just this sentences. And interpret those instructions however they wanted and spend their weekend however they wanted. After the weekend, when they were back at work on Monday, we followed up and measured their happiness. Um, how happy were they feeling right now? How satisfied were they feeling um, when they were back at work on Monday? And what we found was that this simple set of instructions had a significant, statistically significant effect on people's subsequent happiness when they were back at work, that is controlling for their baseline levels of happiness. We found that those who treated their weekend like a vacation, that is just simply reframing their weekend like a vacation, made them return to work happier. Um, and also this simple set of instructions didn't only influence how happy they felt on Monday returning to work, but it also influenced how uh, much they enjoyed the weekend. Now the you know, questions might be sort of why? Well, we asked them, tell us about what you did over the course of the weekend. And we saw that our instructions did shift their activities a little bit. The vacationers ate more. <laughs> they stayed in bed a little bit longer cuddling. Um, and they worked a little less and they did less housework. But notably, these shifts in how they spent their time actually wasn't what influenced their happiness when they returned to work after the weekend. The thing that did was their mindset. So we found, interestingly, that those who treated their weekend like a vacation were more engaged. They were, were more likely to pay attention to the present moment over the course of the weekend. So whatever activity it was that they were doing, they were more engaged in it. And that greater engagement led them to enjoy the time more. And that is what translated into their greater happiness when they got back to work. Um, so even though we can't get on a plane to go on a vacation these days, I really <laughs> we can't go anywhere. Um, what these findings show is that our mindset influences our happiness how we experience our time. And we can benefit from framing our weekends for what they are, a much needed break.
like a vacation. So on Friday evening, when the weekend is starting, mark it, perhaps with a Manhattan and a fancy glass, which is what I, my preference. Um, actually last Friday, um, I got together with some of my colleagues for a Zoom lunch, um, and we were sort of anticipating the weekend, which led into a uh, text stream <laughs> where we were all sharing our beverage, a photo of our beverage that was marking the start of our weekend. Um, and so, yes, mark the start of the weekend in whichever way you want, and perhaps share the loveliness with your colleagues or friends. And this leads into my next piece of advice, uh, which is, I would say, the most important. Even though we can't be in the same physical place, we have to stay connected with our loved ones, our family, our friends, and with our colleagues. Isolation can quickly turn into loneliness, which is a direct route to depression. Across the classic theories in psychology, identifying our fundamental needs, the feeling of being connected and having a sense of belonging is critical. We see this in self-determination theory and in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Interpersonal connection is the most basic psychological need. Having close social ties through family and friends is essential to our health and happiness. Research has consistently shown that spending time socializing is the happiest part of our days. And those who feel authentic connection with others are more satisfied in life and less prone to depression. As this quote about friendship by Sir Francis Bacon points out, not only does friendship improve life, which we want to be true, um, but social support helps manage through the bad stuff, which we need these days. But this connection might look a little different, right? <laughs> and for instance, this was Easter when my mom was meant to be up visiting. Um, and since she wasn't able to be here, in our, staying in our guest room, um, she was on FaceTime from the Easter egg hunt that morning with our kids. So it looks different. And it's hard though, because many of the social experiences that pop into our minds as particularly happy aren't available to us right now, right? So going out to lunch, going out to dinner, um, going out for drinks with friends, um, going to the beach. <laughs> Um, going to concerts or sporting events um, or going on vacation. It's these experiences that hundreds of participants in my research recorded as the extraordinary happy experiences in their lives. And it's these experiences that I was so, so looking forward to in March after wrapping up my intense teaching quarter. Over during the quarter, I found that I found out that I got um, a promotion to full professor, and so my husband and I had a uh, sort of special date night plan for after I finished teaching at a delicious, fancy restaurant. Every year, my girlfriends um, who live now around the world, one in Paris, New York, Houston, we have an annual trip leaving husbands or partners and children at home so that we can just sort of be together, eat, have those amazing conversations. And because we all turned 40 this year, we were having an extra special um, girls trip, um, going to San Sebastian to eat and drink and just sort of be together. And that got canceled. Uh, Every year, one of my favorite things is our spring break, just the four of us uh, with the kids and Rob going to Mexico, where we're just hanging out, being together in this sort of pretty place. That got canceled. And I was so sad when these experiences got canceled. 
hospital than I had to cross the Mollinger. And I'm sure that all of you guys can relate with vacations and life milestones like graduation, getting crossed off. We're left wondering, where can we find happiness? The good news is that there is a lot, there are a lot of happy experiences that are still available to us. There is a lot of potential happiness from the ordinary experiences that show up in our everyday life. In our research, when we asked people to recall a recent ordinary experience that made them happy, these were the experiences that they shared. These sort of simple shared moments with loved ones. So friends, people mentioned pets, family, um, treats. So a cold frappuccino on a hot day, an in and out burger, noticing nature. So sort of noticing the smell <laughs> of a rose that you're passing, noticing a beautiful view. Um, notably, these are happy experiences that we still have access to during these days of social distancing. And the question we had been exploring in our research was which of these types of experiences make people most happy? Is it the extraordinary or is it the ordinary? And in our research, what we did was, in addition to asking people to tell us about an experience that made them happy, we measured just how happy the experience made them. And what we found was that their answer depended on the person's age. So what we found was that among younger people, it was the extraordinary experiences that made them feel happier than the ordinary experiences. But what you also see is that among the older participants, the ordinary experiences made them feel as happy as the extraordinary experiences. And I think what's really interesting here is this contrast where as people get older, um, they start to experience more happiness from those ordinary sort of mundane moments that are part of our everyday life. As we get older, we're more likely to appreciate and savor life's simple pleasures and the potential happiness in these ordinary experiences. But what's interesting and really important here is that when we dug into the, this pattern of results, we found that it wasn't really about age or how old people are. It was really about how much time people felt like they had left in life. So younger people tend to view their futures as more expensive. And as you get older, you tend to view your future as more limited. But there are some young people who are quite aware of how sort of finite our life is. And there are some older people who are, <laughs> think they're going to last forever and live forever. Um, so there's an individual difference here, which tends to relate to age, but not perfectly so. And also, there are circumstantial factors that can influence and that do influence how much time we feel like we have left. For instance, when there is a crisis, like the current one that is highlighting to all of us our mortality and the mortality of those we love. Now, this is relevant here because our realization, all of ours, regardless of age, that our time is ultimately finite makes us realize just how precious our time is, thus increasing our tendency to savor those ordinary sweet moments. In uh, one of our studies, we, instead of looking at just age, we measured how much time people felt like they had left in life um, to examine this effect. And here in this study, instead of asking people to report how happy a given experience made them, we asked them to tell us, the, um, share with us the most recent experience they posted on Facebook because what people post on Facebook are these happy experiences. And actually what you see is what, what people post on Facebook for their experiences totally fall into those categories that we saw generated in our previous study where I will use my husband's Facebook <laughs> as an example, the old ones. But you see that people are likely or often are presenting the extraordinary experience, those sort of life milestones. Clearly, my husband's most important one was marrying me. Um, you know, amazing vacations, 
uh, concerts, uh, cultural events. So those are the extraordinary experiences that people post, but you also see a lot of people posting ordinary experiences. Those simple moments you know, with family, uh, enjoying a treat, uh, noticing a view or nature. And what we did in this study was we, uh, so we measured how much time people felt like they had left and also looked at what their most recent Facebook post was. And what we found was that those who felt like they had a lot of time left were more likely to have posted an extraordinary experience. And those who felt like they had limited time left were more likely to have posted an ordinary experience. But this is important because as we saw amongst their older adults in the previous study, ordinary experiences can produce as much happiness as extraordinary experiences. That is, there is, a, again, a lot of potential happiness in our day-to-day -day lives that we always, as well as currently, have access to. And as this quote points out, these experiences are as much part of our story as the extraordinary ones um, that you know, we had been anticipating and that we had to cross off of our calendar. And now all of us, again, regardless of age, have been sort of horribly reminded of the finite nature of our time left. And we are therefore all more likely to notice these sort of sweet, ordinary moments that show up in our lives at home and connected to the people we love, even if remotely. So when you pause to take those deep breaths and to see and feel, hear and feel the nature around you, you will feel more positive. And even if you can't go out to celebrate your life milestones with each other in fancy restaurants, you can set the dining room table with those crystal glasses you got for your wedding and have never used otherwise on the table next to whatever, in this case, my son's current jigsaw puzzle. And, you know, you can do takeout of a fun meal and create a special date night, even though it was just in your own dining room. And even though my girlfriends and I weren't all able to meet up in San Sebastian for a weekend to celebrate a ghost hunting party, um, we have been getting together and actually more often because we have a standing date every Saturday, which involves a glass of wine as usual for us and those like amazing needed soul filling conversations. And even though we didn't get to go to Cabo for our family's spring break, we did have a great vacation over the weekend. The kids slept in this fort that they made. Um, we spent hours playing Monopoly as our sort of new game. Um, our new game, but clearly it's a very old game. Uh, Rob made donuts from scratch. Rob and I had our wine <laughs> starting at noon, just like on vacation. Um, and we have also pushed ourselves to make what's ordinary a little bit more extraordinary, right? So what would have been a regular movie night that we had with our family, we turned into a full on event. So for the release of the new Trolls World Tour movie, we ordered wigs, Trolls wigs, movie theater candy and Rob set up a big screen in our living room. And it was extraordinary and fun. So I'll just say while there is a whole lot of bad, there is also still a whole lot of good. And we do need to notice it. And this attention towards positivity will prove to be a key tool to get us through this. And so with that, I thank you guys. Um, and I am happy to open up for questions. I don't know if I, I will just, <laughs> uh, I, as I'm reading, as you guys are all watching me. Um, 
So great presentation. Thank you. I found that just having people discuss their experiences leads to the realization that we are feeling the same way and it is a shared experience. Yes, we are all in this together. And um, for that connection, which is so, so important, um, it involves sharing experience uh, through conversation since we aren't actually <laughs> in a shared experience in the same physical space, we are all sharing an experience together. And there is great, actually even sort of more opportunity for really authentic connection because we are yearning for it so much and we are vulnerable and therefore more open. Um, and so I encourage you all to, to share with each other, you know, um, in, those in meetings that again are sort of taking over our lives. Um, in those first few moments, you might take a, a take some time for folks to share, you know, what they're experiencing. Um, you guys heard of the kids in the background. And that's part of it. Like we are all working at home with our not everyone has kids in the background. They have other stuff that they are dealing with, but we are in it together. And it's really important to remember that. And there's a great opportunity for even more connection through that. And it doesn't require being in the same physical location. Um, I know you did a study with the Anderson alumni community to measure how happy we are. <laughs> and how did you guys come out? Well, actually it was fantastic to see just how happy you are. And the problem from my research is front of you was I wanted to see some variation so that I could see whether the um, uh, features of one's experience or circumstances that would influence one's overall happiness. But there was no variation because everyone was so darn happy. And so, and granted, I, this study was um, conducted uh, over a year ago, um, so pre-crisis, um, but it was, heartening as being part of Anderson to see just how happy our alum are and how their experience at Anderson, how positive it was. Again, from a researcher standpoint, <laughs> it didn't turn into a study because there wasn't enough variation, but I would prefer the outcome that I got, which is seeing that folks are happy than, than getting a publication out of it. Um, and then uh, Charles is sharing that another good meditation that uh, provides a series of options is the HALO app. Great. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. H-A-L-L-O-W. Um, oriented for those who are Catholic, but anyone can benefit from the guided meditation. Yes, there are, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and there are, um, I was, <laughs> in, in the ones that I shared, that is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, there are uh, lots of sources for guided meditation. Um, and so thank you for sharing that one. Uh, in my happiness class, one of our, uh, or the final assignment is to uh, design and implement a life hack, a personal life hack. So each person from the science that I share with them about how to uh, increase happiness, they would design an intervention that for themselves that they thought would be most useful. Many actually in managing anxiety, again, pre-coronavirus uh, crisis. But of course, um, we have, <laughs> you know, anxiety is in our lives. Otherwise, as we're, you know, trying to get jobs, um, approaching graduation, uh, you know, managing that uh, work-life balance. So there is anxiety and, um, uh, more than a few students um, implemented uh, um, meditation as their intervention. And so they tried various apps. Uh, some uh, loved the um, headspace. For others, I heard calm. And then others, um, I, uh, it was the Mindfulness Awareness Center. So but there are many options out there. Um, and let's see here. 
And then I, oh, hi, I have one of my former students. Uh, any recs on how to influence leaders to talk about happiness, mindfulness in the workplace? Uh, typically, this is seen as a soft HR work. And yes, I encounter that as I teach happiness at a business school that is viewed as soft um, uh, and not business critical. What would you say to a leader who believes that focusing on employee happiness is a waste of time? What I would say is um, sharing those uh, stats that I, uh, for the research that I shared at the beginning of today's talk, which is um, showing how when your employees are happy, they are more engaged in their work, they are more productive, um, they're less being satisfied with, with their work, but they're less likely to burn out. You see reduced absenteeism, reduced turnover. Um, and if you have a consumer facing interaction amongst employees, then you also see that helping the brand because consumers are experiencing um, the uh, company as positive um, through employee engagement. And so all of these things research has shown does translate into uh, an improved bottom line. So even though I would say as a human who is working with other people, you should care about the happiness and well-being of the people around you, even <laughs> if that is not compelling enough, um, there is research to support that it is good for business. Um, so it is worth investing um, and, and you should. <laughs> and particularly again, in this time where we are, our emotions are fragile. And that is why it's so important to be aware of the emotions of those who are working for you. We have to get to the other side of this. And you want to get to the other side of this with this team that you invested in building and training. And you want to go there together um, and not lose folks along the way because anxiety has overwhelmed them, stress, um, or potentially depression. And I also do want to say that if any of you, um, you are feeling depressed and it is sustained that um, over um, many days that you don't have motivation to get out of bed uh, and or you feel anxiety that is so debilitating that it's interfering with um, your work and your ability to engage with your family, do seek um, mental health care. Um, reach out to your doctor and they will point you to the right people. Um, all of the tactics that I shared are sort of helping us get back on track if we haven't been so overwhelmed, but this is a really hard time. Um, and so if these things don't work or aren't enough, reach out, reach out for support, uh, professional support, as well as the support from those around you, um, not physically again, uh, necessarily, um, but family, friends have those Zoom calls. There are support groups. I know that at uh, Anderson, um, we have set up a, a weekly Zoom uh, support group for faculty and staff. And I know that there are resources available for students um, just as an opportunity to come together and share their experience. As the previous question was asked, um, you know, or sort of observed uh, that there's a lot of value in just sharing the experience, realizing, reminding ourselves that we're not in and alone, um, and that helps. Cassie, we have about five minutes left. Great. Um, I see uh, someone saying, I try each day sharing. <laughs> I try each day to either text or email a few folks I haven't talked to in a while. It's been amazing the response and the feeling um, you get for connecting. And that's awesome. And I'm sure they appreciate it. And it's really interesting, right? Because with this social distancing, what it does is it activates, it reminds us how important it is 
And so while in sort of our regular lives, we might get so sort of absorbed in our day-to-day -day schedule and not taking the time to reach out and sort of through a text or email or a phone call, not even taking the time <laughs> to, you know, hang out with friends or family because we just feel so busy. But what this is highlighting to all of us is just how important those connections are. And so it's been really nice. I've actually uh, almost felt more connected because of those reaching out, just like you're doing, uh, Charles. Um, and or, <laughs> I don't know if Charles is at that, but just like you were doing, um, because it we are reaching out, you know, like these Zoom calls, it, or meetings or cocktails or dinners or whatever they are. Um, you can do those with your friends that live, my you know, college girlfriends or, you know, I've been talking and seeing um, friends that don't live here even more. And even, you know, Zoom, Zoom cocktails with uh, friends who do live here. So there's a great opportunity for connection and maybe even more so. Um, I, I'm, I guess in the interest of time, uh, uh, what if, and then just uh, maybe last question, what if I am living alone? Um, I feel even more left out from couples who are all getting together as couples. You know what? The, for if, if there's this perception that folks are getting together and you're not included, um, set up get togethers um, yourself where you are included. I mean, the, the nice thing is that there aren't these sort of physical barriers for you know, traffic um, and seats at the table. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is, is reach out, set up get togethers, remote get togethers um, with folks whom you wanna see. Um, so don't necessarily wait for the invitation you be proactive and set up those connections. And um, often you'll find that people are just sort of waiting and thrilled. I mean, always you find that people are like, yes, maybe they didn't take the initiative, but since you did, awesome. Um, so thank you guys um, so much uh, for spending this time with me. And I hope that it was helpful and that you can at least pull something from this to help you personally feel a little better um, and try out, figure out what works for you. Um, and I hope that you feel at least a little bit more positive um, than you would otherwise. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Cassie. This was really a great session. I made note of the five ways to find happiness. I'm gonna start by breathing for sure. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts and insights with us. We're gonna send a link to all the participants with materials from today's session, as well as a copy of the recording. And we have another Friday faculty chat coming up next Friday. We will have Professor Miguel Unzueta, who's the Senior Associate Dean of MBA Programs at Anderson. And he's gonna share how Anderson is attacking virtual learning and how the MBA in general will flex to accommodate changing times. So again, thank you all for joining us. Be healthy, be safe out there, and above all, be happy.